You brought your own laptop? All yeah. Right. Can we Great. just hook it up to the projector? Because I didn't know if they had put my PowerPoint there, and I actually just Hello, hello. But that's too loud, isn't it? Yeah. Should I move it? Okay. But you've killed that one. Yes. Good. Oh, I need to do the wireless connection. There's one point where I'm supposed to use the internet. Or pictures of my children appear. Oh, 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 it's gonna it's gonna ask for me to log in, right? Oh, printer's folder. It's like I'm Yeah, I will at one point, yeah. Uh -huh. You know, is this sound? There should be, this is music. It's supposed to have music. Oh, it's not projecting. Well. No, it's, oh, do you yeah. want it to project? Uh, well, that it's this is well, that does stop. That's the thing that I'm going to project. Okay. Are people, is this is there a recording being made of this? Oh, okay. That's why we got everything all killed. <laughs> okay, good morning. Sorry about the delay. We had to power up my computer. I have to say, I have taught in this room, and you guys are like worse than the students. <laughs> is, it, is it possible to sit further away, right? Now, just as a matter of curiosity, how many people are law school classroom instructors? How many people are 
law school administrators? How many people are librarians? How many people are technology staff? Okay, so it's like a complete, okay. Um, oops, oops. Are we, when to turn around? Okay, Jonathan's working on setting up the projector. Okay, so the first thing I have to say, I think this is being recorded. The first thing I have to say is that I told John Mayer, I asked John Mayer at Cali if anybody had given a talk about student privacy rights because with the Cali author program, they're working on tracking student performance better and making that information available to faculty. And so I thought, like, spot the issue. <laughs> so he said, no, nobody had done a presentation like this at Cali. So I said, oh, okay, I'll do one. <laughs> but the problem is, of course, I actually don't know very much about student privacy rights. And then, is this, it seems too loud. Should we turn that mic down just a little? Um, and then there were just not enough hours in the day. So I ran an ad in the um, student newspaper saying, professor seeks research assistant to work on joint project. And the idea was that my student research assistant was going to be here today and help present this. And she was fortunate to receive an offer of employment in Washington, DC. So she's got an externship this summer in Washington, DC. And she's not able to join us. Her name is Margaret Pock. And I have to say for the recording, Margaret did an amazing job. I mean, this presentation, it's 98% Margaret's, and she did a wonderful job. She did just a phenomenal job doing the research, and she just came up with stuff that amazed me. So the first thing I want to do is thank Margaret for all of her amazing research and let you all know that she really wanted to be here today. In fact, I have to say the turnout this morning, on Saturday morning, is at least three or four times what I expected. Um, <laughs> And so I said, you know, Margaret, it's not really worth it to try and fly back from D.C. to talk to, like, four law professors. So, so anyway, so Margaret would have been here but for that. So um, I'm going to go through this PowerPoint, which is, like I said, 98% the PowerPoint that Margaret created based on her research. And if you have any questions anywhere along the way, please just stop and we can discuss things. There's a good chance that Margaret will write this up as a law review article next year. I've encouraged her to do that because... I thought, guessing, based on what I knew about, how many people know that there are a couple of Supreme Court cases involving the Buckley Amendment recently? One of them was the Owasso schools and one of them was Gonzaga. Have people heard of that? Okay, now, do you remember what those cases were about? The Owasso was peer grading the kids' trade papers with the one next to them and then they call out the scores on the math quizzes, okay? And the Supreme Court said that does not violate FERPA. And the other one is really hair-raising. It's a student at Gonzaga was in the education department and wanted to be a school teacher. And some students overheard, I'm sorry, some faculty members overheard some students talking about a girlfriend who was unhappy because she had rough sex with her boyfriend. And the university contacted her and she said, I do not want to make a rape allegation against this person. She declined to, to, to go through with the university procedures for investigating. I mean, I think she broke up with him. You know, I think she felt that was the appropriate way to deal with it or something, right? She, you know, so she was not happy with him, but she didn't want to make... And when, when it came at trial, she testified on his behalf. Okay, so this is like a very weird thing. So, so the people in the education department in Gonzaga refused to file the certificate of competence or certificate of suitability for teaching and more or less ended this guy's chance of ever getting a career teaching. So... You, if you know that those are the two recent Supreme Court cases, I thought, we're going to come up with some gnarly technical little stuff under the Education Act, and we'll all say, huh, isn't that funny, right? And in fact, those Supreme Court cases don't give you any indication of how really interesting the student privacy right issues are when you try and apply them to advanced information technology applications for student learning. So anyway, so after we did all of this, then I like, spent a lot of time looking on the UW website. The University of Washington has a, a project that I'll, I'm supposed to give a demo on the website, has a project about student learning objectives and the faculty code student learning objectives into their teaching materials and then students can get a printout on how they're doing with regard to achieving their, their own personal learning objectives. And so I've like, looked at all the stuff on the UW website and I didn't see a single reference to privacy. I mean, the University of Washington has an amazing program that has tremendous potential for improving the effectiveness of education. And as far as I can tell, 
they're, they're not focusing on privacy as an issue. So that's a conversation that, that Margaret and I may have with some people at UW. Now, another thing that I discovered was how did I discover this amazing new learning enhancement technology at the University of Washington? I was researching a presentation for this conference. I thought, well, that's funny, you know, because I show up and teach here every day at the University of Washington and somehow hadn't, hadn't heard about it. So anyway, so, so there's a lot of things going on. I think that it's still relatively at an early stage in terms of implementation here. So the most important thing is if anything strikes you as interesting or problematic or you want to contribute something from your own experience at your own institution, I'd really be delighted for you to just stop me as we go through the presentation. Okay, so overview. Um, in 1974, the federal government passed a statute called the Federal Education Record Privacy Act, which is known as FERPA, but most people know it as the Buckley Amendment because it was Senator Buckley that put it in. Um, and it applies to education, educational records, and um, this presentation is going to try and, and, and walk you through the precedents under FERPA for educational records. And the reason I think that this isn't something, we weren't able to find anything, there, no, there, that's not true. The National Science Foundation paid for a study of how universities were monitoring student use of technology and considered it in light of the Buckley Amendment. But by and large, there, there are two huge long-term trends going here. One of them is uh, increased awareness of information privacy issues, and the other is increased pressure on higher education to develop metrics for performance. So if you know anything about developing metrics for performance and you know anything about information privacy, you can see this is a train wreck. Okay. So then we have a specific example from the University of Washington. And with regard to the implications for Cali, I have to admit, we never got back in touch with John Mayer. I think that this is still under development. I think he hasn't fully uh, implemented all the, the monitoring technologies that he wanted to in Cali. So that part of the presentation is, is a little ambiguous. Okay, so what's FERPA? Okay, in 1974, the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act uh, was enacted, and what was happening in the 70s was uh, educators and government officials were using sort of modern sociology techniques and doing surveys of students, but they were asking like pretty hair-raising questions, and we've got some examples here. Um, so there was concern that all this information was going to be stored on computer. Now, if you know anything about uh, privacy law in the United States, you know that the first information privacy law that was ever enacted in the United States was in 1970, and it was the Fair Credit Reporting Act, and it protects your privacy rights in your credit report. And in 1974, a statute was passed called the Privacy Act, which is actually much narrower than you'd think. It governs the rights of citizens with regard to information retained by the federal government, and it was enacted post uh, Watergate when it was discovered what Nixon was doing with people's tax records. And so it prevents, you know, government officials from just wandering through government databases on fishing expeditions. It requires, you know, uh, specific procedures. But, so in 1974, 74 was the year of the Privacy Act. So this is a time when people were sensitive to the issue that, that uh, government might be uh, exceeding, you know, its legitimate scope of uh, investigation with regard to computer records. Okay, uh, here. Okay, so what did Senator Buckley have to say? He said, uh, when, when parents and students are not allowed to inspect student records and make corrections, numerous erroneous and harmful material can have a devastating negative effect on the academic future and future prospects of an innocent, unaware student. Now, as a matter of fact, if you actually look at that John Doe versus Gonzaga case, uh, Gonzaga argued consistently, and the Supreme Court held What's going on in the Gonzaga case is not really about educational records at all. It was about lack of due process. Um, so, in, so the Gonzaga case would be a great illustration of this, except that, in fact, the Supreme Court held it wasn't actually a FERPA case. But, um, okay, what have we got here? These are some examples that my uh, student found going back through the congressional record. These are some of the, um, the queries that, uh, you know, educators were making of students and then they were uh, uh, preserving this information. Would you like to run away from home? This is like, really hilarious. <laughs> I belong to a group that is often chased by some adults, such as storekeepers, police, or homeowners. I mean, can you imagine? This is like, how many people know about the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act that was passed in the year 2000? This is a cousin of why that law was passed. 
In the internet environment, a lot of dot-com entrepreneurs were inventing business models that, that involved collecting personal information from children and selling it as marketing information. And so their business model for their website was that there was no charge for the services on their website. And so in um, 1999, I think before that statute was enacted in the year 2000, there were hearings and the Federal Trade Commission came up with all of these truly hair-raising examples of things like you can imagine there'd be websites of like, Bobo the Clown, play with Bobo, you know, Bobo says, hi, what's your name? He says, My name's Jimmy. Where do you live, Jimmy? You know, I live in New Jersey and like, Jimmy, how much do your mommy and daddy earn? You know, and people would just type this, you know, little kids were typing this stuff into websites. And so, um, so this is like, this is, reminds us of the testimony that was given during the, the legislative hearings that ultimately produced the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. So, um, now, this is just a little aside. This is one of the only slides that I actually added to this presentation. What came out in the 1970s as part of the the legislative drafting processes that resulted in the Fair Credit Reporting Act and the Privacy Act and FERPA was a general concept called fair information practices. And this idea is pivotal in understanding information privacy rights. And in 1980, it was enshrined sort of globally in the, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development um, guidelines on uh, fair information practices. So. In the 1970s, the United States was a world leader in thinking through the public policy and law reform issues associated with information privacy rights. And so we can see just from the sketch that I've given now of the terms of FERPA, um, the idea is that you shouldn't be collecting information about people if they don't know it, which remains a huge problem in the United States, um, that there should be consent. Now, the notice and consent element in FERPA is sort of implicit because you understand that you're in an educational process and, and your educational records are being created. So what was innovative about FERPA was this requirement that educational institutions give access to the student and to the student's parents. And in addition, there's a requirement of security, which is that only the authorized users be allowed to access that information and other people not be allowed to access it. So I just couldn't resist going on to point out that since 1980, um, there's been another 25 years of debate about information privacy and the current hot issues in the last five or ten years are questions about whether or not information privacy laws or policies should restrict onward transfer reuse of information by, by third parties. Um, and in the European Union, for example, where they have strong information privacy rights, there are very uh, strong restrictions on onward transfer and in strong information privacy laws in the United States, like the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, those people are not allowed to share that information with third parties without explicit consent of the parents. There's another important concept which um, is fundamental to modern thinking about fair information practices, but it's not much embodied in US law, which is that the scope of the information you collect should always be restricted to what's relevant to the task at hand. So if you think about the way U.S. marketing works, in fact, in, in the large unregulated market for personal information in the United States, we honor the opposite principle, which is collect as much information as humanly possible, right? So I can't remember, I think I just bought some kind of appliance and the little card said, you know, send in your warranty card and tell us your household income, you know? So why, you know, why my household income would be relevant to getting a warranty on my digital camera is totally unclear to me. So that would, for example, that would be a violation of EU privacy law, but it's not a violation of any US law. Okay, so scope is an important issue. And then uh, one of the things that's very controversial is the question, how should information privacy rights be enforced? And FERPA has a very, very limited enforcement mechanism which is um, if you think that you haven't been treated properly, you petition the Department of Education and they conduct an investigation. And one of the important things that was decided in these cases, the Owasso and the John Doe case, um, is that there is no private right of action under FERPA. As a general rule, you have to get enforcement taken uh, by an agency. So FERPA is a very general education privacy right, but it has a very weak enforcement mechanism. And so in the last five or 10 years, privacy advocates have become very sensitive to that problem, that you might be able to get 
enacted a broad privacy right, but without an adequate enforcement mechanism, you still don't have much effective privacy protection. Okay, so these are just things, if you're thinking about education records and student privacy interests, these three additional concerns are things that are widely debated and of great concern in the privacy community, but U.S. law doesn't currently force a lot of focus on those issues. Okay, so what does FERPA actually, so FERPA is an example of an of a information privacy law that embodies fair information practices, but not everything on the, the long list that we now think of as part of that concept. Okay, so it applies to any educational institution that receives federal funding. So this is a familiar thing. The same thing is like, what's the, ed, what's the sports program thing? Title seven? Title nine. Yeah, title nine. So it's the same concept, is that if you accept federal funding, you have to uh, comply with this. Um, okay, no funds should be made available, which has a policy or practice of releasing or providing access to any personal identifiable information other than directory information without the written consent of the student. Okay, so the, the universities have to have policies and procedures in place that meet the standard of FERPA. And what are the actual rights that the statute gives you? Uh, parents and students may inspect and review their educational records. So this is that access right. They may challenge the content. So there's an accuracy in interest. If you know about your credit report, your rights under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, if you think that you're being dinged unfairly, you have a right to contest the, the merchant's uh, claim that you're behind on your bill or something. And uh, s schools releasing student information from a student's ed education record, besides directory information, must obtain written permission. Okay, legitimate educational interest. So this is like an exception that's large enough to drive several trucks through, but it's not unlimited. So the right of a post-secondary student to consent doesn't exist if the educational institution determines that a school official has a legitimate educational interest. So um, I think we can all give examples of that. If it's related to the student's pedagogic objectives, it's related to the student's educational needs, that's appropriate. But for example, say for example, I had a student that was particularly troublesome in class discussions and was not responding to my efforts to channel their energy in more social directions. I would not be allowed, for example, to go up and look up that student's grades to find out if they were in trouble in their other classes. <laughs> That would not be a legitimate educational interest. The, I think there was one um, not too long ago. This is just an example of we all should know better, right? Like, we should know better than to think you can look up the student's records just because out of gossipy, sort of like purient interest. Um, another thing that we should know better, there was a situation, I can't remember which university it was. They set up some kind of... Um, online discussion group, and I have to admit, I haven't been using things like WebCT or, or any of those programs. People who, who put their classes online and have online discussions. So there was one of these troublesome students that took a shot at the professor, and the professor responded by saying, like, who are you to opine about this subject because you got a C on the exam? <laughs> so, so, yeah, so that, that comes under the heading, like, we should know better than to do that stuff. So that was in a moment of weakness that faculty member slipped. And of course, that's clearly a violation of the student's privacy rights. Okay, although it, from the point of view of the professor, you can see why they thought it was relevant. Okay, so what are educational records? This is the one that blew me away. This is the one that shows, and this is, what it says is, is information directly related to a student. Now, do you notice what's missing from that? Anything about learning, right? It's information directly related to a student. So does this mean that, that the question of whether they only buy Diet Cokes with their university smart card in the university concession? Is that information directly related to a student? Well, yeah. You see, see what I mean? It's like, whoa, that's really amazing. And if you go back and think about what, what Senator Buckley was angry about, those surveys, this is deliberate. They did this in the 1970s. They intentionally made the protected interest as broad as possible. It's not just directly related to grades and evaluation of, of learning performance. Okay, and it's maintained by an educational institution. Okay, personally identifiable information would include information that makes the identity of the student easily traceable, such as name, address, or personal characteristics. So we all know how this works, is that you can think that you've sanitized the information and removed all traces of, you know, uh, personal identification, but if in context it's still obvious, you have a problem. At my, I used to teach at Southern Methodist University, which is a much smaller university than the University of Washington, 
And I heard rumors that for many years there was only one full professor in the business school. And so if they disclosed by category, by gender, they were just putting her salary information into the public domain. So that would be an example where um, it, makes the identifiable, it makes the identity traceable rather than directly uh, disclosing it. Okay, so what's the enforcement mechanism? And, and as I've indicated, there is an enforcement mechanism. I think most higher education institutions take their obligations under student privacy laws very seriously. But if you think cynically about the enforcement mechanism, it's relatively toothless. Okay, so um, the Family Policy Compliance Office at the Department of Education is responsible for uh, investigating uh, violations of FERPA. Okay? And if you go onto the website, it has all of these things like model letters for institutions to mail out to their students, model letters for people used to submit complaints. It's, it's a very well designed, very user friendly website. So they've done what they can to make, it, uh, to make the information accessible to people who might be uh, interested. Okay, so uh, remedies, termination of funding by the Department of Education, like, whoa. You, you can see what the problem is, is there's a lack of granularity in the consequences. The tendency is going to be to say the violation isn't material. Okay, so, um, and compliance can't be secured by voluntary means. There's actually a third remedy, which is an injunction. They can, the, the court can issue an injunction to cause an institution to stop doing what it's doing. But in, the most important thing is that there's no private right of action, and that was just decided by the Supreme Court. If there was a split in the cases, it's now been resolved. Okay, so FERPA applies to any educational record. It's not limited to electronic ones, even though it was, the statute was written in the 70s and they were concerned about computers. It's not limited to electronic. But this presentation is limited to electronic. Okay, so... Um, now, uh, here's an interesting question to show um, sort of the lack of clarity of FERPA. In these recent Supreme Court opinions, Justice Breyer said, the language of FERPA is incredibly broad and incredibly general. And he was using that partly as an argument to explain why there couldn't be a private cause of action, because the poor higher educational institutions don't have too much very concrete guidance. Now, there are regulations in the CFR and uh, there have been amendments, but the amendments haven't addressed sort of the intersection of computer technology and uh, uh, privacy. So there isn't much clarification on this. So one question would be, uh, what about computer logging files? Now this is one where maybe the people who are the tech people at law schools could help me. I mean, does anybody want to volunteer any information about, I would guess most law schools either don't save very much logging information or save it for an incredibly short period of time just in case there was an investigation and then they overwrite it? Yes? I, it, what, say, say the students are on the intranet and they're accessing course web pages tracking what the students do when they're on the web page, or tracking students' internet use when they're using university-provided facilities. So no, it's not, the logging is the actual accessing of different things in the system, the activity of, of using resources, not typing in an email. Because the email records, that's a separate thing. So this is, does everybody understand what we're talking about? We're talking about just monitoring online behavior. Yes? Now let me ask you this question, which is just because I'm not that good about all this technology stuff. Would an individual student's laptop have a permanent IP address, or is it like dynamic so you could say, on Tuesday this person, but I'm not sure the identity. But. So you can track that down. Okay. Uh-huh. Okay, so, the, so you have an ad hoc record management rule of just saying, like, if there was an investigation, say, for example, uh, in another context, I overheard a hallway conversation about um, there was a sexual harassment problem at a law school where some male students were bombarding a female student with IM messages that were inappropriate or something. 
it's like I didn't quite understand the whole thing. But that would be the kind of thing that suddenly if there was an investigation like that of inappropriate behavior by some students, you'd have the information available going back a few weeks. You could, you could generate it, but you're not preserving it. OK, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh -huh, right. So that's that's clearly the case. If if they turn on their computer and and go to the restroom and the students sitting next to them, you know how all the students are 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 putting bids on eBay during class now, right? So a student goes to restroom. Student next types inappropriate things on the computer when they come back. It's like, gee, I never did that. Okay, so that's right. You can't. You couldn't without further evidence. You couldn't prove it was a person. But you could prove that the computer was used. Okay, but the, but I have a question for you, which is like this gentleman just said he purges them like regularly after a relatively short interval. So you you save it in case there should happen to be an investigation, and if there's no investigation, you purge it. Hmm. Uh huh. I'm sorry. Your policy is based on. Uh huh. Mm hmm. Right. So you you would analyze network traffic to make sure that you had optimized the structure of your network, that that people were able to access what they wanted to, and that things weren't overloading. Yeah. Uh Yeah, there's a, that's one, that's one, um, I mostly do e-commerce. There's a really great case, I, if you teach, anybody teach evidence, it's called U.S. versus Sidiqui. There was a professor, I can't remember where he was, like Alabama or something, who forged letters of reference in support of his application for a grant. And um, when, what, what caused the, I can't remember, it was the National Science Foundation that was administering the program, what caused them to become suspicious is they generated their conventional thank you letters to all the refer referees. And one of the referees called up and said, pardon, what's this about? So they began an investigation. And I think it's a circuit court. It went all the way up to the circuit court. And so, of course, Sidiqui's lawyer said, you know, email's not secure. You're not using encryption. You have no sophisticated authentication technologies. How can you prove that these emails came from me? And they said, well, because first of all, the witnesses testified that you called them up over the telephone and said, if whoever it was, Department of uh, Defense or somebody, if the government people call you up, say that the reference was from you, please. <laughs> right? And then there were emails confirming this. Okay? So they said, now, what makes us think that these emails are really from Professor Sidiqui? And the answer was, because the witness testified to the telephone conversation and the email referred to the telephone conversation. And the witness said, every email I've ever gotten, his name was Muhammad, every email I've ever gotten from him came from that email address, and it had his typed nickname, Mo, M-O. And so under those circumstances, they said, there's no real issue here. This is as credible as any other evidence that we consider in litigation. So that's right. I mean, if you have that other contextual information that people can say, well, that person, you know, they always use that particular phrase. It's, it's not... You know, it's something that I associate with that person's style of expression. Then you've got that connection between the computer and the person. So that's yeah, that's standard. You know, you can either you either have the evidence or you don't. But it's if you have the evidence, it doesn't have to be advanced technology. Okay. So anyway, so we're, are there were any of the, now? Let's go ahead. There's, this is where this, the interesting study is: is the um, question about logging. So everybody understands what we're talking about with logging. So this is a new thing that we can monitor now, and because the compute, the students are interacting with their educational institution by means of computer, these are arguably records covered by FERPA that previously didn't exist. Okay, so the National Science Foundation, I wrote down what that stands for, it's LAMP. It's a very, very interesting study. Logging and monitoring privacy. So the LAMP project was logging and monitoring privacy. It was done in 2001 had a lot of participants. And the question was, uh, they were asking people, now imagine we have this log data. What do you think? Do you think FERPA applies? OK, hypothetical number one. University has an advanced smart card system, smart card data. 
that is collected includes the student's time stamped location data from uh, key card access systems, students' meal purchases, and library records. So 86% of people uh, queried agreed that this would be an educational record. Okay, so is that like surprising? Because I have to say, this is the kind of thing that really surprised me. And when you go back and you read the text of FERPA, it's like, it's pretty hard to disagree with this. This is very broad. So, um, so universities need to be thinking about whether or not they have policies and procedures in place to safeguard the privacy of these records. Of course, if the university wants to do the kind of internal management analysis that you were talking about, of course they can do that. You make the data not personally identifiable. You just consider it in aggregate. You anonymize it, and then you analyze it and say, you know, all the students are buying pizza between, you know, 11 o'clock at night and 1 o'clock in the morning at this one location. We need to open a second location. Of course you can get there without looking at the personally identifiable records. Okay, printer server logs. For accounting purposes, university logs name-related use patterns on printing services. Data includes name of student, student's account number, number of sheets printed, time and date of sheets printed, and whether the printing was graphics or text type. Okay, and so 71% agree. Now this would be one, again, you're talking about optimizing the use of your network. I mean, a, a law school that's considering whether or not they need to give students an allocation of pages and then charge after that, this would be directly relevant. So this one was less clear to people that this was an educational record. I don't know. I would tend to think it is. Is this the kind of, is this the kind of information that people are collecting? Yes. Yeah, because you need to understand how your network is being used. Sorry? Uh-huh. Okay, so that's very good. So that's right. So that would be that whole right of access and the right to correct inaccurate information. Just as a matter of curiosity, if a student says, I didn't print those 2,000 pages, have you ever had one of those disputes that was resolved in the student's favor? <laughs> this is a matter of curiosity. Never. It's just like whiny student syndrome. They print the 2,000 pages and then they think, ooh, that's too expensive. I couldn't have done that, right? I couldn't have possibly printed that much, yes? Yeah, that they should be subject to policies and procedures that guarantee that, that personally identifiable forms of this information is not released without the student's written consent. You see, I mean, there's, there's a couple of things. You have to have policies and procedures, and if you want to release it where you have both the student identity and the data together, you have to have a procedure for making sure you have written consent. Yes. Remember, no, this is like, I could, should I, ooh, ooh, can I go back here? What's the exception? There's an exception. The exception that I, oops, is this an education? No. There, that's the exception. Do you remember? Legitimate educational interest. Now, so the idea is you have no privacy right if the reason, say for example, I'm in the academic support program. You know, one thing you could, you could get the students who join the academic support program to sign a consent saying, I give the academic support program faculty permission to look at all my records, but they don't have to because those people have a legitimate educational interest. Now, trying to make sure that the people who printed the $2,000 really pay for it, I don't know. <laughs> That's not quite the same, but, but I think this is where you have to go. There has to be an exception for internal administration. Yes, that is clearly one of the obvious and important consequences of the application of FERPA. Is that the rule we have in the United States, the general rule is you should always start out on the assumption that you have no rights 
to prevent the disclosure of your personal information unless you can find a specific statute. Okay? So like I, th when I teach e-commerce, we spend a lot of time comparing the European perspective and the U.S. perspective. The default rule in the European Union, because they have very strong information privacy laws, is that no one may ever disclose your personal information without your consent unless an exception applies. Right? So in, in Europe, the default is that all personal information is embargoed unless the person that wants to disclose it can prove that they have a right to disclose it. The opposite applies in the United States. People can collect as much information as they want about you. They don't have to tell you. They can share it as much as they want. That's the whole marketing information industry, right? The Direct Marketing Association does all this stuff. So the rule in the United States is everything can be shared by anyone unless a special rule applies. And so, for example, if you know about HIPAA, the Health Information Portability and whatever it is Act, gives you a, a, a privacy right in your medical records. That was just passed a couple of years ago. Until then, you had no formal statutory privacy right in your medical records, but you do now. Um, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, how many people get those annoying notices from their financial institutions saying, here's your privacy rights under my policy? That's Graham Leach Bliley. That's a specific, your credit report, you have a specific right. So the important thing to understand here is that there's a categorical difference between companies providing computers to their employees and telling them, you have no rights. You have no privacy rights. I plan to monitor everything. We have keyboard logging, <laughs> right? And it's like, there's nothing to stop businesses from doing that. It's like, if you don't like it, quit and find another employer, okay? In higher education, these rights are not optional. The students have these rights, and the universities have to accommodate them. Yes? Ooh, that's an interesting, that's, yes, that would be the case, that's right. So, now, fortunately, I work for a state, and so I have, as a state employee, I have certain rights under state, you know, just like the Privacy Act. The Washington State uh, Legislature would give rights in, in, you know, government records, but private employers might not have those, yes? But in some ways, you have uh, fewer rights than, than students. At the, in the University of Washington, they can say, you can only use you know, computers for work, a staff person isn't supposed to shop, but there's no restriction to a student. Mm, scary thought. Yeah, we won't, we won't, we won't pursue that one. <laughs> so yeah. So the answer is that's true. These are. This is about because there's a hierarchical power relation that's not as clearly present with the the faculty member as employee. Yeah. So um, yeah. So it's like pretty amazing the scope. So so this is the thing that we just my student and I discovered. And the other thing we discovered is that. What's that 71% figure? That was a survey of actual, you know, teachers, you know, university technology staff, university administrators. What's the legal status of an opinion survey? <laughs> okay, so do you see that, that the point is that there's relatively little hard guidance in this area. People are just sort of guessing. Okay, and then uh, number three, the dean is curious about the work uh, productivity of a student staff member. The dean asked the student administrator to collect information on the student's use pattern because, in fact, the work study is putting bids on eBay while getting paid by the hour by the by the university to be photocopying or something, right? Okay. So time of access, content viewed, email destination, log off time. Okay. The administrator secretly turns on a logging function and collects the requested data. Now, 64% agreed that this was an educational record that experts replied don't know. Okay, because this is exactly, now you've got this intersection. If it was a private sector employee, they would be categorically, there's a, okay, there's a little thing in the Wiretap Act that says you have to consent to the monitoring. So what do people do? On the day that you're hired by a private employer, they give you a, you know, four-inch thick paper manual, and in it it says, we reserve the right to monitor all of your technology use at any time without notice, further notice to you. So then they've consented by showing up for work. Okay, so technically with a private employee, if you didn't have an IT policy that said, we may at our discretion engage in monitoring and that's a condition of your employment, if you had never actually said that, you might possibly violate an employee privacy right. So any, any thoughtful employer will have a IT use policy that gives them the right to monitor. So, um, but he, so here you have the intersection. This is a student employee who's arguably goofing off at work, you know, playing computer games or whatever, and the employer is a university and the student is a student worker. So I think, I think it's a genuinely hard case, yes? Is this a work study? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. The, the, 
Um, if you want to read the whole study, it's about 60 pages long, and it's very interesting. If you type in like NSF LAMP into Google, you'll get up the whole study. I don't, I don't remember if the URL is in the PowerPoint. But it's a really interesting study, and I have to say this is one of those where the student has actually read it, and I've just sort of flipped through it. And I thought, this is very impressive. It was, the methodology was, was, was very thoughtfully constructed. It's a very interesting study. But ultimately, it's about trying to understand the way people who deal with these questions understand their obligations. It's not a legal research paper. Right? It's, nobody is giving advice on, on the correct application of law here. OK, so policies today, educational institutions vary in their approaches to computer logging. And FERPA policies for educational, electronic educational records range from strict to looser. Now, another thing that we just flat out, just flat out didn't go into is state laws. And I think almost every state has its own law that would apply to institutions in that state. So one of the reasons you might see variation in the policies that implement FERPA is that the university council are hitting two standards. They have to hit their own state law standards as well as the federal standard. So in every state, you should assume that there's a, in a, a second body of legislation that would apply. OK, so North Carolina State, um, North Carolina State, and, and Margaret found this on the internet. You know, she was like surfing around doing all different searches and stuff. So the Uni North Carolina State University discloses this on its website, that, that we ask you to use WebCT and we consider the records, the logging uh, uh, records generated to be educational records subject to FERPA. That's what they're disclosing, that, 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 that that's their interpretation. Okay, so, but here Arizona State says, on the one hand, on the other hand. <laughs> Classic lawyer waffle. Maybe, right? Okay. Okay, now this is, the, this is where that we sketch out the train wreck that's coming as higher educational institutions are put under greater and greater economic pressure to come up with metrics to justify the money that they get. Okay, so, so Margaret went out and, and did some research on this whole question of, of performance-based uh, evaluation for higher education, and she discovered that there's several different models uh, being implemented in different uh, situations. Um, universities could uh, commit by contract to specific outcomes, and then they have to agree metrics in order to determine whether the university has met its contractual obligations. Um, in this state, in particular, uh, the University of Washington would dearly love to get permission, in, we have it in the law school on a temporary basis, get permission from the state legislature to raise tuition to something approaching its economic, uh, you know, true economic value. So that might be a, you know, something that the university could trade performance uh, objectives for. And then um, another one would be, now this one, the third one, I think that's what they think they're doing in England. One of Margaret Thatcher's huge reforms of English education was to require these internal assessments. And, and I have colleagues that are faculty members in England, and they just hate this. It has to do with like counting the number of pages published per faculty member. I mean, you know, when you have this obsession about metrics, then it becomes very weird. But in England, the allocation of central government funding for higher education is, is based in very substantial part on these periodic uh, performance evaluations. Uh, so the third one, as far as I can tell, that is actually the system that Margaret Thatcher implemented 20 years ago in England. Is it working very well? Is the quality of education improving in England? No. Why? Because the total pool of government funding for education is diminishing in real terms. Okay, so, so you can have performance criteria and following performance. Okay, so um, the number of states with some form of higher education performance measurement is increasing. Performance indicators uh, can include some of this. It's like in, in, in information technology, people talk about granularity. Okay, so some of these are fairly gross, like number of degrees awarded, right? Um, Student satisfaction, that's hilarious. I mean, anybody who's a classroom teacher knows, like, student evaluations of faculty are really interesting, but they have to be interpreted for meaning, right? You can't just take them at face value. And the best example I know is um, I, have, I have a colleague who teaches at the University of Melbourne where law is an undergraduate degree, and he was teaching two sections of torts, which is an undergraduate course to, you know, 18, 19-year-olds. And I think there were maybe 30 students in each section. And so one section, he regularly brought muffins. Okay? Otherwise, there was no difference. No difference in the way he conducted the course. And what a surprise. His evaluations were dramatically better in the muffins section. 
Okay, so he, he shared this information with the central administration because Melbourne is following the same track as the English universities to try and develop, you know, objective metrics. So some of these we have to be a little concerned about. Okay, efforts are currently underway in the state of Washington. And um, so, uh, so we can see that, that people in the University of Washington are saying positive things to the state legislature about this. The University of Washington is desperate to get more money out of the state legislature, so I, I would assume that that comes under the heading of, like, we'll try anything within reason. Okay. Now, the University of Washington, this program, I think, is four or five years old. I think it's relatively new. If you type in, you know, student learning objectives into the UW website, we're going to have, if we have time, we're coming close to the end, I have a demo that we can do. Um, Okay, so this is really amazing, the student learning objectives. The, the department, first of all, because the idea is what if the department is performance music as opposed to biochemistry? So one of the important things is that the faculty remain in control of developing the assessment criteria, and they have to work with the technology people to come up with a system for encoding the materials that are provided so it can reflect the diversity of the different university departments. Once the encoding has taken place, then all kinds of reports can be generated. And the one that's like really amazing is the Milo, the student system. The student can track their own performance. Now, okay, as a law school faculty member, I thought, can you imagine how demanding these people will be when they hit law school? Right? They're just not going to put up with the Socratic method stuff. Okay. So anyway, so so it's a system that the University of Washington is developing, and and if you if you're not an employee of the University of Washington. Ask your home institution to license it because the University of Washington is hoping this will be a revenue generator. Okay, so um, okay, so every course gets a hundred, and uh, they can. The university provides templates of, of learning objectives, and the faculty and the departments are supposed to debate about whether you know which ones of those matter to this particular department. So um, you know, it's supposed to be customized to allow for uh, this is this is the primary target is undergraduate education. So. You know, they want people to understand society and the environment. Okay, now, this is where we do the um, demo. But now, I'm not sure that this is one. It's supposed to be in here. Ooh, wouldn't that be amazing if it worked? The URL is in there. The hyperlink is in there. Okay, here we go. Now, unfortunately, the graphics aren't quite right because we're not getting the whole thing here. Okay, so we skip the intro? You all feel, like, incredibly impressed by these graphics. Okay. So, okay. Okay, which one? We don't have time to listen to all of these, but these are like little video clips of students talking about how Milo helps them actualize their potential at the University of Washington. Okay, so they don't actually say that, but they, they sort of, that's the general drift. What do you want to hear? How many people want to hear, who will you become? Yes, this is like, this is pretty amazing. The, the Office of Educational Assessment in the University of Washington goes out and does statistically valid samples of graduates 10 years out and they ask them to self-evaluate. It's like, oh, well, that's not very scientific. But anyway, okay. So the University of Washington is trying to develop mechanisms for testing whether students get what they want after graduation. On the Progress tab, Milo gives you the power to compare your learning profile with those of others, same with all juniors or all poli-sci majors. Milo lets you compare your emerging learning profile with those of UW alumni in various professions everything from teachers to engineers to CEOs to musicians. These comparisons may let you know which of your learning objectives need more development so that you can make smarter course choices. Isn't that like amazing? She needs to work on her teleprompter skills. So. Okay. Okay, so let's go back here. Whoops. Using slideshow. Is that okay? Is it, so you get the, you can, that's all. The, that demo is on the UW website. You can peruse it at your leisure. Okay, the implications for Cali. Okay, so at this point, so actually it's fortunate we have more or less come to the end. So we, we never sort of closed the loop and had a detailed discussion with John Mayer because he said, oh, you know, it's not ready to be released yet. Okay, so Cali author will have some minor variation of that kind of thing that they're trying to do with the my student learning objectives. Um, but the idea is that we need to be tracking more and then... Um, Okay, now, this is an interesting one. So at the University of Texas, students who wish to learn the Blackboard uh, system were required to consent to the release of their directory information. Now, remember, directory information is excluded generally from FERPA. So they were sort of pushing for a um, fairly uh, 
expansive interpretation of their privacy rights. Um, but the students actually said, uh, you shouldn't be able to condition our, our participation in this particular class on agreeing to these disclosures. So obviously this whole thing about like written consent, there's going to have to be as the technology becomes more invasive of the student's sort of psychological development, it's just like medical records. We're going to have to have a system where we're going to say, under these circumstances, you can't condition participation on consent because it's an abuse of your power. That students have to be allowed to, to retain certain confidentiality. And remember, as a matter of administrative policy, that should be allowed because most of the relevant stuff that administration needs can be gathered by analyzing the data in anonymized form. Right? There, there aren't that many legitimate reasons why you'd say, like, we have to be allowed to disclose your personal identification because most of the um, institutional objectives don't actually require that. If it's not already covered by the learning um, legitimate educational interest exception, that covers an awful lot of uh, disclosures. Okay, and then here's another one. This is like, okay, in the e-commerce situation, one way that you terrify people in business is you say, like, think about... Think about the horrific liabilities that might open up based on those independent contractors you hire. Because this is really hilarious. Like, like, how many people know who Kevin Mitnick is, right? The famous hacker? You know, he earns a living today as a security consultant, right? So, like, multinational corporations invite Kevin Mitnick in to come in and explore the vulnerability of their system and give them reports on it. It's like, what are they thinking? Okay. So, anyway, so the same thing here is that, um, you know, as people outsource IT, you need to be worried. So that's just another, that's a general uh, business uh, observation if you use independent contractors. Yes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have to say, I haven't got a clue. Um, that would be one where in the Code of Federal Regulations, there are regulations that, that provide a lot of concrete guidance. I would guess, based on the conversations that Margaret and I had and the things that I've read, see, I've, I've just never seen anything written analyzing those issues. My guess would be that inside individual universities, there may be individual university council that have puzzled through that question, but nobody's publishing anything. And so the answer is, I personally don't know, but the, the, the regs might get you partway there. So this is, do you see why I'm encouraging Margaret to write this up? <laughs> This would be like really useful to have a law review article written about this. Are there any other questions? We're getting close to the end. Okay, well, thank you very much for coming.